Say it with me, passion. passion. And we learned that uh, among, among the patriarchs, perhaps among the prophets, the one who displayed the most passion was Jacob. And Jacob did not get it from Isaac, but Jacob got it from his mom. And we were, we were looking at uh, the influence of the mothers uh, on, uh, on their children. And I was mentioning, for example, even in the education of my kids, it was my wife was actually very passionate regarding the education of my kids. And she was the one who sought out the house who were going to be transferring uh, a scout for the schools where they will be going and made all the, all the study. So uh, passion is something that uh, <clears throat> unless, unless you have it, it's like a dead shell. You know, and, and sometimes you're doing something, you, you have the skills, you have the uh, abilities, you have the education, but there is no fire inside. Something, something has got to burn inside you that will propel you to do things that normally you would not do. And that is what you call as passion. And we also learned that uh, with this uh, passion, you have to mix it with uh, patience. When the Lord gives you a call or gives you a vision, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, you will, you will uh, get it overnight. There's a pastor in Michigan. He was a former Marine, and he was a disciple of Pleasure Samuel. And he said that he went full-time four times. You know, and every time he, he goes full-time, his wife, Kathy, I, I forgot the name of this guy, his wife, Kathy, will look at him and say, Hey, uh, sweetheart, uh, how long is, is this going to last? And he said it, it infuriates him because he really wants to go full-time, but he will go full-time. There's not enough money in the church. So he said he will get an extra job, and the extra job means quitting the ministry. And so he will, he will be still serving the Lord. And then he did it a second time, a third time, and on the fourth time, so he was asked, why, why, why is it that you just uh, did not choose to serve uh, in the church in different capacity? Why do you need to be a pastor? He said, it burns inside, he said. Especially that his uh, mentor was Lester Samuel. He said, it burns inside. So he was encouraging young ministers. He said, some of you uh, quit the ministry, just keep going at it. But you will not keep going at it unless you have passion. And if you don't have the passion, you don't have the fire. That's why there's a lot of people that we say are sorry gifts because they have a lot of gifts and they seem they seems to be uh, endowed with a lot of things from their families, but there's just nothing. And by the way, because last week we were studying the faith of our fathers, and this is, this is sometimes the dismay of the, of, the, of the parents because the kids don't, wanna, don't want to get the business that they have. They don't want to walk in the paths of the fathers. They just don't have, they just don't have it. And some of them end up squandering <clears throat> what should have been a source of regular income. Ansa Kuyan, uh, Ahmed was, was telling, was, and, and, uh, and uh, my wife was telling me this also. Their grandfather who started the business said, uh, kids, you take care of this business. I established this, this is known. If you take care of this business, they, they, he, he said, in, when it's your term, you don't have to work hard, you, you, work hard. you will just... Uh, harvesting money. And you know, uh, Besa Shoes in the Philippines, they cater to the rich. That, that's why during pandemic, uh, sometimes they have zero income per day, simply because the rich have plenty of shoes and bags. And so they don't want to go out of their uh, houses, they can afford it. But now it's, it's, it's going back. But, but he said this, my grandfather is correct. But he's the only one among all the family members, among the grandchildren, who really took after the business that his grandfather started, you know. And, and now that, that uh, Bong Bong Marcos was, was elected, I was teasing him. I said, when are you going to display the picture of President Marcos with your grandfather? Because his grandfather made the shoes for President Marcos. I said, when are you going to display the picture? Because he removed all the pictures during the campaign. You know, because he said, some people, if you are supportive of Marcos, they're going to go after you. So he removed all the pictures. But now that he was elected, I said, hey, when are you going to uh, post the picture? 
And he said, I I'm going to wait one year <laughs> till everything settled down. He said, when everything settled down, I'm going to display the pictures. Yeah, because this is, just, this is just business. But he took care. He has the passion. And he walked after the business with his father. And as I was telling you guys, if, we don't, if I don't raise my kids properly, that's the end of it. You know, I may have the vision, I may have the passion. If they all backslid, that's it. And there's a lot of families like that, that they get saved, but that's it. Because none of the children went after, I mean, look at the Walgreens pharmacy. It's not run by the Walgreens family anymore. Because the children doesn't have the passion. It doesn't have what it take to run the business. And that is what, what we need to understand. It, you know, they say in democracy it takes, Reagan says it takes one generation to lose democracy. Well, in Christianity, it's the same. You look, you look at the history of the church and the scriptures, one generation will serve God, the next generation backslides. And the third generation is limbo, and sometimes third and fourth generation before they come back. That's why we should have been very successful as a church in the world, but, but not really, you know. That is also the failure of the Chinese, because the, the Chinese refuse to pass on their knowledge. You, you really have to extract, you know, for example, one, one manufacturing, every manufacturing firm. You know, here in the U.S., some people uh, made the die cast, some people made the screws and the bolts, and that's not in China. Uh, Brother Willie told me that, for example, if one American company goes there, they will rent a very big warehouse and everything is there. Nothing lives in-house. They manufacture the screws, the plastics, the glues, everything that they need to complete the product. So I said, I said, why do the Chinese do that? He said, we don't want to share anything to anybody. That's why the, their progress, although they progress, their progress gets retarded. They should have been well, the, some of the oldest generation in the world. But they should have been very much ruling. But they are not. They refuse to pass because every generation, that's the end of it. And now they're in big trouble because of the one-child policy that uh, the Mao, Mao Zedong en enacted. Now they have a big problem because now majority of their people are old and they're asking who is going to pay the, uh, the pension fund because it takes uh, young people to work. But they lack young people now, you know. And nobody wants to take the business of their fathers. That's why in Hong Kong, they have a law. Uh, I don't know if the Communist Party will continue that with the developments in the last three years. They have a law, if you start a business, say you are pushing carts and picking up garbage, and then you prosper, you don't abandon the pushing of the cart. Yeah, It's a government law. You cannot abandon that. That's why uh, there's one eatery there that we're eating. It's, they just make congee. It's on the streets. It's, it's very good whenever uh, I go to Hong Kong before the pandemic. And the brothers, it's two men, established the business. After a few years, they prospered so much. And so they bought the building that they are renting, and then they raised four-story building. But at, outside the building, you will find this cart, the push cart where they sell congee. So I asked, why, why is it there? This is a beautiful building. He said, that is the law. So I asked, why is that they have a law like that? So that the children will not forget their beginnings. Because when they forget their beginnings, then they don't have the faith of the fathers and they abandon everything. And that's the demise of that business. You see? Now they, 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 they are getting it this time, at least in Hong Kong. Christianity is the same. We need, our, our children need, uh, they need to catch the passion of the parents. You cannot teach passion. It's, it's caught. Now, what kind of passion are you passing on? Simple question. What goes on in the dinner? Uh, what, what kind of conversation do you have on the dinner table? What is it that comes out all the time? That's your passion. Can you imagine if your dinner table is full, full of gossip and bad mouthing? and uh, all kinds of negative things, that is your passion. But for example, in a dining table, you talk about doing this, doing that, and going for this. That is going to be their passion. Now, this is the, the problem now. Most people, most families don't have dinner time or family time together. Everybody eats whenever they want, and they don't have a family time together. 
That's why in my family, I make it a point that we eat together. I don't care if you're going to eat or not. I already ate. It doesn't matter. It's dinner time. You sit on the table. Because there's a lot of things that, that goes on on the table. And, and you, you need to catch the conversation. That's when you catch the vision. Okay? That is when you catch the vision and that's when you catch the passion. Now, the passion for the birthright was uh, uh, the occasion for the journey of J Jacob for his self-exile in Haran and back. Let me read to you Genesis 28, verse 1. So Isaac summoned Jacob, blessed him, and commanded him. Do not marry, now listen to this, do not marry a Canaanite girl. Okay, because that's what his brother did. It's not because he's, she's Canaanite, it's because she's out of the faith. God wants to put down Aram to the house of Bethuel, your, your mother's father. Marry one of the daughters of Laban, your mother's brother. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and multiply. And multiply you so that you become an assembly of peoples. May God give you an offspring. Now, now uh, Isaac is blessing Jacob. <clears throat> May God give you an, and your offsprings the blessing of Abraham. You see that? So the, the Abrahamic blessing was passed on to Isaac. Now it's being passed on to Jacob. So that you may possess the land where you live as a foreigner. The land God gave to Abraham. So Isaac sent Jacob to Padan Aram. Now that is north. But the blessing of God, that's temporary. The blessing of God is not for him to possess Aram. That's not the blessing. The blessing is for him to possess the land that God gave to Abraham. That's the land he was living Okay, because of his deceit and trying to preserve his life, this is what you call as delay. Okay, Paul said he wanted to go to them, but he was delayed. To, to, that, is, that is to Spain. He was delayed. You see, you have to understand that sometimes when, when we don't go by the leading of the Holy Spirit, you can be delayed. Even Paul was delayed. And sometimes the delay is not caused by your disobedience. The delay is caused by spiritual struggle, spiritual warfare. Remember Daniel when God gave him a vision and he was asking for the interpretation of the vision and he fasted for 21 days and he, he, could, he could not then understand the end time vision. And so on the day, the angel Gabriel said, on the day that you asked for interpretation, I was dispatched from heaven. To show you the interpretation. But the prince of Persia. Okay. There's a movie prince of Persia. And they glorified that thing. But in the Bible the prince of Persia is Satan. Okay. But the prince of Persia. He stopped me. Now I don't know where it is. But it's in the heavens. They struggle. And, and Gabriel is a strong angel. He's a messenger angel. He's not an archangel. But he's a messenger angel. He struggled with, with Satan. And he could not prevail right away. And God knew that. So then God sent Michael to struggle against Satan. And Gabriel was able to free himself and went to, uh, went to uh, Daniel and gave the interpretation. And he gave the interpretation to Daniel and Daniel says, I still don't get it. And said, seal up the book. And Daniel perhaps says, well, what, what, what are you going to do? I'm going to go back and fight. The fight was still going on. So sometimes the delay is, is because of this spiritual struggle that is going on around us. You know, sometimes you, you feel like you are being delayed in your, in your vision, and you say, I, I'm doing everything that I can. Well, sometimes it's just because of the result of spiritual warfare going on. Now, what prevailed was the prayer of Daniel. So what would prevail is likewise our prayers. But here the promise is for the land that God gave to Abraham. So Isaac sent Jacob to Padan Aram, to Laban, son of Bethuel, the Aramean, the brother of Rebekah, the mother of Jacob and Esau. Esau noticed that Isaac blessed Jacob and sent him to Padan Aram to get a wife there. When he blessed him, Isaac commanded Jacob, do not marry a Canaanite girl. And Jacob listened to his father and mother. Look at that. Jacob listened to his mother and father, not just to the father or to the mother, to his mother and father, and went to Padan Aram. Esau realized that his father Isaac disapproved of the Canaanite woman. So Esau went to Ishmael, 
and married in addition to his other wives, Mahalath, a daughter of Ishmael, Abraham's son. She was the sister of Nebaioth. Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. He reached a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set. He took one of the stones from the place. I like this. Put it there at his head and lay down in that place. And, when, and, and, he, and he dreamed. A stairway was set on the ground with its top reaching the sky and God's angels were going up and down on it. The Lord was standing there beside him, saying, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham and the God of Isaac. I'll give you and your offspring the land on which you are lying. That is in Bethel. Your offspring will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out toward the west, the east, the north, and the south. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. Now this is Abrahamic. This is what God told Abraham. Look, I am with you and I will watch over you wherever you go. I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you. You see that promise, I will not leave you, I will not forsake you. And Jesus repeated the same thing to his disciples. Uh, that, that, is, that is a remarkable statement because in the Old Testament, only God is making that statement. And Jesus made that statement to his disciples, declaring that he is the, the Son of God. Um, when Jacob awoke from his sleep, he said, surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. He was, look at, surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. He was afraid and said, what an awesome place this is. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early in the morning, Jacob took the stone that was near his head and set it up as a marker. He poured oil on top of it and named the place Bethel, though previously the city was named Luz. Then Jacob <clears throat> made a vow. If God will be with me and watch over me during this journey I am making, if he provides me with food to eat and clothing to wear, and if I return safely to my father's family, then the Lord will be my God. This stone that I have set up as a marker will be God's house, and I will give you a tenth of all that you give me. There's a lot of things that happen here. So Jacob, and he did all of that because uh, Jacob was uh, very passionate for his birthright. And, and let, me, let me reiterate uh, the kind of, of passion that we have. And he went to Padan Aram, waited for at least two decades, and, uh, and went back to the promised land. But he, felt, he, he kept his promise. That, that is, and that is a seg, that, that is a side track of over 20 years, you see? Because Jacob was, he was passionate but hard-headed, stubborn. He, he's, he's very passionate, but his passion get the best of him. He was doing things without knowledge. He was always going ahead of God. Now, this is one of the things that will delay us. If you go ahead of of God. I am really very thankful on this one because we have, we have the money for a possible down payment for, of our missions property in the Philippines. So there are a few properties shown to me. And uh, I was told by a few people, are you, are you ready to buy? I said, I'm, I'm ready to buy. And, and my wife asked me, are you going to move forward? What is the Lord telling you? I said, nothing. You know, I, I said, nothing. So are you going to buy a property now. I said, I can buy it now and, or I can buy it later. But there's no rush in my spirit. So I said, nothing. It's very difficult to, to commit yourself to something like that and then you don't have the word of the Lord. And I don't have, I know we need to have a property there, but I don't have, it's now. Well, I, I sat on it. Our money is in the bank. Guess what happens next? COVID-19. Can you imagine if I bought the property and right now, prices are just sliding down. This is the best time to buy it. So when we go this uh, August to the Philippines, that is one of the things that I will pay attention to in the first week of my travel there with, with my wife. We're going to look at several places. And now there are, there are people who want to stay in the, in the U.S. And I was told you can even pay them in the U.S. You see, and, and they will allow it to happen. 
this is now a best time to get that. But you see, you have to be patient. Now, if, if, you, if you are in a rush and you say, now, now can you imagine this? Remember what, what, what I was telling you guys? Well, the interest rate was, was low. Uh, it's time to, to get a property because of the interest rates. I mean, it's two point something percent. Now it went to over 5%. It went to over 5%. So if you are paying, say, for example, $1,700 of mortgage before it went up to 5%, that would double. And most of it will go to, to, to interest. So now it's becoming prohibitive to buy because of the rising interest rate. You see, there, there's, there's always this opportune time that you need to be able to read. And if you, if you are not able to read that, I mean, blessed are those who are able to refinance before this, this uh, rise of interest rate. Because now you're locked in, you're only paying over 2%. You see, that's where uh, I and I locked in. Oh, but now you buy 5 going 6%, and they say it's going to keep going up. Remember, there was a time the, the interest rate was at 8%. I mean, can you imagine from 2 point something to 8%, you are paying tons of money on interest. And, and it's, it's becoming very prohibitive for some to acquire a property. That's what I call opportune time. Now, if you say, well, I have the means, but you did not get it, then you will be delayid because now instead of paying one, one seven, you'll probably be paying three thousand dollars. You see, that's a, that's a difference here. Now, if you go ahead and still do something that you cannot afford, and the Lord did not tell you, and the Lord is not with you, then you will end up losing the property also. Then you get delayed even more. You see, that's why sometimes people sit there and say, "What are you going to do?" Well. You have, to have, you have to have peace in, inside and make sure that the Spirit of the Lord is telling you. Jacob deceived his father with his mom, Rebecca. What happened? An over 20 years trip to Padan Aram. And when he came back, his mom was already dead. He, he did not see his mom anymore. That's the kind of delay that he had because he was only blessed to, to, to change the name Israel during his wrestling with the angel of the Lord. That was a long time. You see? And we will see the implication of that even more. So he was passionate about the birthright. He was passionate about the blessing that God is giving him. Now, some of us at a certain point in our lives believe there is a call in our lives. Are you passionate about it? You know, my calling is as a teacher. I, uh, I never liked crusades. I did crusades. I never liked it really. But uh, during the height of the evangelism ministry in the Philippines, these evangelists will have seminars. I'll attend the seminars on how on equipping, you know, the whole day teaching. But I will not attend the crusades. That is my passion. You need to be passionate uh, over, over the call that God, I don't care what it is. You've got to be passionate about that. Because if you don't have it, you will let it go. That's why I don't understand these people say, well, you know, I, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm just, well, I thought it's your call. I thought it's your call. And, I, and some of the calls, you need to have a lifetime passion over it, like marriage. You need to have a lifetime passion over the thing, okay? So actually, it's the next topic. Jacob was also passionate, passionate over his wife, okay? That's, that's a beautiful thing. Genesis 29 tells us the love story of Jacob and Rachel. Uh, this, is, this is some love story. It was, it was actually very passionate. The only story that can rival this love story, uh, whom, whom do you guess in the Bible? A love story that can rival this. Certainly not Abraham and Sarah. I mean, that's an old love story, you know. What is a good love story that can rival the story of uh, Jacob and Rachel? Ruth and Boaz. You cannot say that, but you did not say it. Yeah. I mean, wh what else is there, you know? This, they say that the story of Ruth and Boaz can, can, can rival some of the, can rival Romeo and Juliet. That's what they say. Now, can you imagine if, if you write on the love story, of uh, Jacob and Rachel. Let me read to you chapter 29. So we're in chapter 29 now. Finish three. This is the third <laughs> chapter. So. Jacob resumed his journey and went to the eastern country. He looked and saw a well in a field. There, flocks of sheep were lying there beside it because the sheep were watered from this well. But a large stone covered the opening of the well. The shepherds would roll the stone from the opening of the well and water the sheep. I know why, why they would put 
put a, a big stone. In those days, you only put a big stone if you want to put a limitation as to who can draw water. Now, who, who guess who's putting the, uh, the uh, stone? The male shepherds. <clears throat> so they would return the stone to its place over the well's opening. Jacob asked the men at the well, My brothers, where are you from? Where from Haran? They answered. Do you know Laban, Nero's grandson? Jacob asked again. They answered, We know him. Is he well? Jacob asked. Yes, they said. And here is his daughter, Rachel, coming with, uh, with his sheep. Then Jacob said, Look, it is still broad daylight, and it's not time for the animals to be gathered. Water the flock, then go out and let them graze. But, but they replied, So now Jacob is teaching them how to, how to shepherd, you know. Uh, th these are some government workers here, you know. They, they dismiss early. That's the, I mean, government workers, you know. But they replied, we can't, we can't until all the plaques have been gathered and the stone is rolled from the well's opening. Then we will water the sheep. While he was still speaking with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep. For she was a shepherdess. As soon as Jacob saw his uncle Laban's daughter, Rachel with his sheep, he went up and rolled the stone from the opening and watered the uncle, his uncle Laban's sheep. Pasikat, you know. Yeah. He wants to impress Rachel, so he rolled. I'm going to do it on my own. Normally, a couple of shepherds. <laughs> I said, it's a good love story. But, but Jacob says, whoa. Because later on, you will see what he saw. Uh, Rachel was not only pretty in her face, she was sexy. Meaning, she doesn't have the Pepsi Cola bottle uh, body. She's got the Coca Cola bottle body. You know? uh, and, and he. <laughs> He looked at her, whoa. You, know, you, you have been traveling in the desert for so long, and now for the first time, you saw this beautiful girl. So, whoa. I'm impressed, you know. Uh, who, who is the first, who, who's the other guy who, who made an impression like that in the Bible? Also, also an exile. Moses. But Moses beat the guys, you know. <laughs> Moses. You want to get a girl, do, do what they did, you know. So, so they just impressed the, the girl, and, and, and my goodness, he, he got her like, uh, at, at this point already, you know. As soon as Jacob's uh, water, then Jacob kissed, bah, I'm belief, you know. <laughs> then Jacob kissed. <laughs> nah, ibang klase talaga itong hudyo, ano, talaga. Uh, he, he, he kissed her right away. Then Jacob kissed Rachel and wept loudly. By the way, who did this? Upon seeing the girl kissed her right away. Huh? Come on. Who? Isaac. He saw Rebecca kissed her right away. So maybe, maybe uh, no, I'm not saying you guys do that, okay? But I'm just telling you what happened in the Bible. <laughs> hey, Dad, what did you do when you see my mom? Oh, I kissed her right away. So there, there you go. Like father, like son, you know? Uh, he told Rachel that he was her father's relative, Rebecca's son. She ran and told her father. When Laban heard the news about his sister's son, Jacob, he ran to meet him, hugged him, and kissed him. Then he took him to, to, his, to, this, to his house, and Jacob told him all that had happened. Laban said to him, Yes, you are my own flesh and blood. After Jacob had stayed with him a month, Laban said to him, just because you're my relative, should you work for me for nothing? Tell me what your wages should be. This is a good uncle, you know. He's not going to get a free labor from him. He's offering him a job and with a salary. Tell me what your wages should be. Now, Laban had two daughters. The older was named Leah. The younger was named Rachel. Look at this. Leah had tender eyes. That's a beautiful English translation, but bad, you know. <laughs> Literally, what it means is, Leah was cross-eyed, okay? Duling, you know. So, hey, Leah, come here. Here's Jacob. And Jacob was there. Leah was there. Hey, hey, Jacob. No, I'm here, you know. <laughs> Duling. But, but Rachel was, look at this, shapely. 
Kuha ko lang battle, you know? Shapely and beautiful. You know, people, people, my wife asked me, why, why did you like me when you saw me? I said, because you're pretty. And, and, and sometimes she really says, you think I'm going gonna, gonna to look at you if you're ugly? I said, you're wrong. You know? Pe- people try to spiritualize these things. But this is part of our... Of our <laughs> you're, you're laughing, Joella. You're too, you're too young. <laughs> and uh, you, you look at these things. People think it's kind of... No, it's, it's normal. God created us to appreciate these things. She, she, he likes to look at a girl that will look back at him. He doesn't like to look at a girl... I mean, do you like somebody talking to you? And here you are. And, Hi, DJ. How are you doing? I, I'm here. No, no. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> that's that's Leia. Jacob loved Rachel, so he answered Laban, I'll work. Look at this, huh? I mean, I thought, this is like a fairy tale. I'll work for you seven years. I, I don't want to look at the husbands here. Any, anyone of you here work for your wife? For seven years, you know. Uh, for your younger daughter, Rachel. I was, I was counseling one, one, pastor's, one, one pastor and his wife to be. Uh, they're going to get married. If, if I am the brother of this girl, I would, I would have slapped the boy, you know. So I asked the girl, why do you... What makes you like this man? You know, when you ask a couple to be married like that, they come with these cute answers, you know. And you have to peel through the lies and the uh, flattery yeah, and the pretenses. And she, she made her pretenses. That's why I love him, you know. So I asked the guy, why do you like her? The guy was very cocky and he said, because she's easy to get. I said, what? And the, the girl was embarrassed. What, what did you say? She's easy to get. You know, and, and I heard they don't have a happy marriage. <laughs> yeah. Now, can you imagine to be treated like that? Now, this is these seven years. You know where you find this seven years courtship? Where do you find this? Certainly not in America. Here, people don't know each other's name yet, and they sleep together already. So not here. Where do you find this? In ancient Philippines. Before they learn how to, you know, how to be civilized. They, they will, they, the courtship back, back in the ancient times in the Philippines is long. Uh, so here's seven years. Laban replied, better that I give her to you than some other men. Stay with me. So Jacob worked seven years for Rachel, and they seemed like only a few days. Wow. Seven years, a few days. This guy is, is madly in love. I'm telling you, he's a very passionate guy. How many of you here, guys, I will not look up, you know, is willing to work for seven years for your wife? And there was silence in heaven. Sila for one hour, you know. Then Jacob said to, <laughs> then Jacob said to Laban, since my time is complete, give me my wife so I can sleep with her. So Laban invited all the men of the place and sponsored a feast. That evening, Laban took his daughter Leah and gave her to Jacob. Oh, wow, what a deceit. And he slept with her. You know. And Laban gave his slave Silpha to his daughter Leah as her slave. When morning came, there was Leah. So he said to Laban, what have you done to me? Well, in the first place, what in the world did you do? Why did you sleep with her? People say, because he was drunk. Okay, well, let's, let's accept that. Okay. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Uh. Why have you deceived me? Laban answered, it is not the custom in our country to give the younger daughter in marriage before the first birth. This is not a strict custom. Okay, you can read in history, this is not a strict custom. This is an excuse. Complete this week of wedding celebration, and we will also give 
you this young one in return for working yet another seven years for me. So how many years in total? 14 years for a girl. I mean, they make you old before you, you get married. And Jacob did just that. He finished the week of celebration, and Laban gave him his daughter Rachel as his wife. And Laban gave his slave Bila to his daughter Rachel as her slave. Jacob slept with Rachel also, and indeed he loved Rachel more than Leah, and he worked for Laban another seven years. That is some love story. Fourteen years. Now we have girls marrying boys with no job, you know. But but this is this is some kind of, of sacrifice that. Uh, my wife asked me that question, are you willing to do this for me? I said, that's a bad question, because we're already married. You know? But how many, honestly, how many of you will be willing to say, I will work 14 years for this girl? Tapos yung pala, buangera lang, patay. A motor mouth. You know? so, uh, the only thing, as, as I said earlier, that can rival this story is the story of Boaz and, and Ruth. The passage that we have just read has all the elements of a great love story. It has passion. It has sacrifice. It has ups and downs. It has struggles. It even has deception, a complete drama. This, this actually will make a great TV series. You know? It will compete against the uh, Filipino soap opera and the favorite Korean opera of my wife. You know? By, by the way, some of you love watching Korean opera also. This, this is going to rival all of those things. And, and the, the, the plot is, is something else. It was not really a plot. It just happened. As a, it, it just goes along, you know. But, but this is one of the things. By the way, when, when, you are pa, when you are a passionate person, you are a passionate person. You can actually isolate that. My, my favorite professor in at Regent University when I was a student there is Dr. J. Lyle Story. He is retired now. Of all the teachers that I have in Bible schools and seminary, he is very intense. Even by the way he spoke, just very. I like his intensity. He's a very passionate guy in, when when it comes to teaching, and. The, the only other passionate person that I know is Brother Willie. You know, when, when Brother Willie is speaking, his, his, his veins will, will be popping up, you know, uh, and, and he will be turning red and be, he will be sweating. Just, just to make his point. A doctor's story is more intense than that. He's just a very intense, very passionate. I asked him one time, hey, Dr. Story, wh why, why don't you open, they have no PhD program during that time yet, they started with the mean. I said, why don't you go for a, for a PhD program? He said, they told me already. I said, why won't you do it? He said, I am not going to do anything unless it is first class. He said, why will I start something that is second class? The passion of that guy. Yeah. You, have, you, have to, you need to have passion over what you're doing. If you don't have passion, you will run out of energy because your passion will give you the fire. Some of the career choices, some of the jobs that we have, it really requires a lot of inspiration. But then, there's, there's a lot of people. Uh, you, you know, during the pandemic, in one of the articles that I read on, on ministry, some of the pastors wants to quit. I, to, I told you at least 10,000 pastors wants to quit. I, I, was, I was just disappointed. And so they made an interview. Uh, Why are you not quitting? And they said, this is where my pension money is. Now, can you imagine staying in the ministry because of pension? They don't have the fire anymore. They, they just, there's, so they don't like what they're doing. So why are you doing it? I have no other job. There's just no passion. It's like some workers for some company. I hate my company. Then why are you still here? I have no other job. There is no more passion. You, you've got leaders like that with no passion. It's a dying organization. Now, this, this same thing, again, with family. If your family doesn't have the passion to, to, to maintain that family and to grow that family, that's it. I told you about one of my 
professors uh, from Germany during the Nazi regime. They opposed Hitler, so Hitler killed the family. And very few of them managed to escape Germany. I forgot the last name. The last name starts with letter B. The guy is now working at uh, Liberty as an associate dean. And, and they gathered. They were able to uh, come here to the U.S. And they, they gathered together. And says, he said, we have a big family in, in Germany, they, they, they said. And said, but, but Hitler almost killed all of us. And very few of them were left, men. What are we going to do? And they said, we will rebuild our family. We cannot allow our family to be erased from the face of the earth. So he said, well, we'll get married right away. He said, if we have boys for our children at the earliest age possible, we'll, we'll get them married. Right now, there's a whole town in Michigan. Almost everybody that lives has their last name. I mean, it, it, it took two generations, and they have one complete town. Now, that is some kind of passion that, that, that they have. And, and some of them became theologians, good workers, but all from Germany, you know. You need to have passion. Look, uh, because of the pandemic, the, the Roman Catholic schools, in, I don't know if it's all, and is it all over the years, just Chicago, just Chicago, right? Uh, their enrollment blossomed. I mean, they have, they have a phenomenal growth in enrollment because the Catholic church, uh, the Catholic schools wanted in-person schooling. So a lot of parents took their children on the public schools because of online learning, which, of course, my children don't appreciate. I know about your children. And they enrolled them in Catholic schools. But this is the problem that, that they have. They say that even in their Catholic schools, they are losing their faith. That is their big problem. They are losing their faith. You are, you are a student of a Catholic school, and you, and you know, part, part of their course is for you to take Roman Catholic Magisterium. Um, it's, it's a study of the Roman Catholic history and doctrine. I, I took Roman Catholic Magisterium in the seminary. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the Philippines. It was taught by a Jesuit. But here, it, it turned out, it's, it's part of the curriculum in college. And still, they are losing the faith. Now, the highest, the highest growing religion in the U.S. right now is Islam. Yeah. That's the highest growing religion. And boy, are they passionate. I was... I was driving along Lawrence and Kedzie a couple of years ago. And during lunchtime, I heard this noise on the trumpet speaker. I said, what in the world? So loud. First time in all my years in Chicago, I said, what in the world is that? But I know the sound. I said, oh, it's the Muslim call to prayer. And it went on every day, I was told, for a while until the community resisted it and say we cannot have noise pollution and so it was stopped but they are that bold they are that aggressive and they are also feared you see but they have the passion uh, especially uh, muslims coming from turkey in the history of islam the turkish muslims are the ones with the ambition to conquer the world okay they, they are the ones with the ambition you study your history the Turkish Muslims are the ones who has the ambition to spread. They're the ones who, the, the Turkish Muslims were the ones who defeated Constantinople. You know, and uh, they, they are passionate about this. 1960s publication of the Evangel magazine, the Assemblies of God publication, Springfield, Missouri. A Christian journalist was interviewing a communist. This was after uh, the fall of the Qing, uh, Qing dynasty. And then Mao Zedong took over, and the cultural cleansing, when around 40 million Chinese were slaughtered, or 60 million, something like that. And so this Christian uh, journalist was interviewing this communist, and then the communist, uh, the communist said this, the Christian gospel is more powerful than the communist gospel. And of course the Christian journalist, yeah, yeah. And he said this, but we will win and you will lose. He said, you have a more powerful gospel, more powerful than the Muslim gospel, but we will win and you will lose. And so the journalist asked, why did you say so? He said, because if I believe in what you're teaching, 
I will walk through the fire and broken glasses to tell my fellow Muslim on the other end that there is hell. He said, you Christians, you live like there is no hell. You have no fire. That's what that comment said. You know, in 1982 or 81, Luzon Congress on Evangelism convened by uh, uh, Billy Graham. I, I have the figure, but I don't have my, my manual right now. The Roman Catholic Church earmarked so many hundreds of millions for global discipleship of Catholicism. Globally, hundreds of millions. The evangelical Christians also earmarked a couple of hundred million dollars. They say, we will evangelize the world. Islam was asked, how much is your budget? They say, it doesn't matter. We will pay whatever it takes. Yeah. We will pay. With, you, know, you know, Filipinos during the 70s, they'll go to the to, to Middle East to work. They were being paid during that time, I don't know how much now. They were being paid something like $700 to be a Muslim. So a lot of Filipinos, when they go to, to Saudi, they become Muslims for $700. And then they are, they are Catholics again when they go back to the Philippines. They say, we're be, they're being paid money. It's like that. And the Muslims earmark no amount. Whatever it takes, we will evangelize the world with Islam. That is the difference. What is that? Passion. Yeah, passion. I mean, look at our passion. We can see our relatives going to hell and we're smiling. Hey, listen, you, you, your relatives are going to hell and they're smiling. Oh, it's, it's okay. God is love. Yeah, but you need to repent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eventually, they'll, there, there is just nothing in there. There's just no passion. And it's just like you, you see your kid fooling around in school. What do you say? Hey, listen, straighten up. But some parents just don't care. They, they have no passion. Oh, it's okay. Let them take their time. They're already getting old. You have no passion whatsoever. You see, There's got to be some passion. It has to be brought back in order for us to have fire in our belly and move us and propel us to do what God wants. And this is what Jacob has. He kept his marriage. He kept the promise. He kept the birthright. He kept the blessing. He was a passionate guy. If you, if you don't have passion for it anymore, what's, what's going to happen? You're just, you're, you're just going to sell it. You're just going to sell it. Uh, there's just no passion. Okay. Uh, our house, uh, I, I don't like the city. My wife is a city girl. I don't like the city at all. I, I would love, God willing, I know if God will give me the, the chance, God willing, I would like to own a farm, you know, build me, build me a house, and I don't care if I have no neighbor. That's, that's just me. I like to own a farm, you know, take care of some. Maybe I'll ask Brother Lawrence to go with me. Maybe, you know, Brother Robert can join, you know. And, and I, I told Brother Lawrence, let's, let's, get, let's get some goat. You make me some papaitan, you know. Uh, produce our own milk. And because when I pray, I like walking around. I said, in my, in my old days, I just want that. So I told my wife, let's sell the house. No. I mean, she is very passionate about the city. I said, well, what, what do you want about this congestion? She just liked the city. You know? uh, I don't have that. Why am I not in a farm? Because, because I love my wife more than she loves me. You know? she, 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 she's not willing to go to the farm. I'm willing to go to the city, you see? So, uh, but that's just the way it is. But she's very passionate about that. Uh, just, just sheer passion. You need, we need to have that fire back. That's, that's, this is... This is what I've been telling you. I am jealous over this. Okay? Some people will say, well, I have not seen my relative, my friends for 20 years, and you don't attend the church because your friends came. Well, pastor said, I can't bring them to church. Bring them to church. That might be, the, that might, if you have never, never met each other for 20 years, that might be the only chance for you to witness to that friend. After that, that person may go to hell. But what happened is you have never seen him for 20 years and he pulled you out of the church. 
absolutely zero passion. Yeah, zero passion. I told you about my grandfather, raised in mainland China, because he was able to exit uh, Hong Kong during the uh, Communist Revolution. Grew up in mainland. And we saw each other just once. I was already a pastor, and he's not. We see each other in the province. He doesn't know Tagalog. He knows Chinese. I don't know Chinese, but he doesn't know Tagalog. And so we are to, to Bisayan, speaking in English, you know. And he asked me, uh, let's, let's drink. I said, no, I'll buy you a call. We have not seen each other forever. And we may not see each other again. I said, that's right. I will pay for your call. But I witnessed to him. I said, I'm a pastor. I'm a Christian witness to him. And later on, my, my, my mother asked me that. Why, why didn't you give in? I said, that will be my only witness. And guys, look. Unless he's Abraham, he's already dead. Okay? But there is a witness. I shared to him Jesus. I did not compromise in front of him. But I don't care if I offend him. He doesn't know me anyways. I don't know him also. I'd rather offend him. Because that may be my only chance. And it eats me up. I'm, I'm telling you right now, it eats me up. When somebody tells me, I have not met my friend for 20 years, and now you're out of church. For a couple of hours, for goodness sake, if you really have an influence, bring that person to church. Because this, that might be the only chance that you have to bring witness to that person. And you may end up losing the chance after that. Plus, you compromise, they know you can, you can be bought. And that is my passion over, over these things. But, but it is being ignored in this church. You see. But that is just me. Okay? We need, we need to recover this, what, what, uh, what Jeremiah said. Your word is like, like fire burning in my bones. You see, it, it pushes you. So he has that passion. Jacob also possessed the passion to possess the blessings God gave to him. I gather this from Jacob's relationship with Laban. The two agreed on the compensation that Jacob will have in return for the work he renders for Laban. You know how, how the strict goats will be his. And, you know, who is this? Dr. Paul Yonggi Cho preached on visions and dreams. And he said he put this straight collar in front of the uh, watering trough so that the goats, when they eat, when they drink, they will see this and they will have a vision. I don't know where they got that, you know, but, but anyways, that's preaching so they can preach whatever they want. But, but the one that came out are all straight and he ended up having more, more uh, flock than, than Laban. But, but look, Laban wants to steal from Jacob. By the way, when something is stolen, some, some, uh, uh, an animal die, Jacob pays for it. With his, own, with his own flock. If one of Laban's flock died of sickness, he replaces it. And Jacob was cheated by Laban. You know what Jacob says? I'm not going to let you cheat me. Now that is some, God gave this to me. Why, why in the world will I, will, will I let you? you? You know, I have seen Christians today, the blessing that God gave them is being stolen left and right. And they're just smiling. Oh, we are told to love one another. You, you don't allow the devil to steal from you. The, the, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Why do you think that the Bible tells us that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy? So that you'll be aware. The Bible says we are not ignorant of his schemes. We are not ignorant of his schemes. Now, this affects the relationship. And if he will allow Laban to keep stealing from him, this affects the blessings that God is giving to him. Laban's wealth, even Laban accepted this, increased because of Jacob. If you, are, if you are rightfully serving God, wherever you are, God will bless it. That's why there is security uh, in Christianity. You know? Christians today say, well, we cannot, we cannot work on Sunday because our company demands. Too late. Too late, really. Because uh, the Seventh-day Adventists already proved to us we are wrong. The Seventh-day Adventist Christians... 
are, uh, are begging off on Saturdays because they worship on Saturday and they're being allowed. And so I, I have some friends before with the Seventh-day Adventist movement. I work with the Seventh-day Adventists in the Philippines in our uh, social uh, uh, programs. And, and they told me this. They said, why will they not allow us to beg off on Saturday? We are their best workers. And I inquired in Chicago, the Seventh-day Adventist Christians, Filipinos, they have the best reputation among nurses. They're the best. And so when they say, please, le let us uh, uh, have our day up on Saturday. Be, now, not all of them are doing that, but those who are really good workers, they allow. To, to, because they are good workers. It's their loss if they, if they lose them. But that is, that is because they believe that the seventh day is when they should observe the Sabbath and the blessing of God is there. They won't allow people to take that blessing away from them. Uh, look, we are... A rest day in the presence of the Lord is one of the blessings that we have. I, I don't know why Christians don't get it. It's, it's not a curse. It's a blessing. Your body is meant to work for six days a week. Now, some people think they are Superman and they will keep working. No, no, you are not decided. That's, what, that's how you get sick. That's how you will lose your blessing. God says, if you set aside the seventh day, by the Christians in the first century, celebrate two days, seventh day and the first day of the week. If you honor me, and that's the word that was used, if you honor the Lord on the side, if you, if you honor that, I'll bless you. I'll, you will not lose anything. I'll bless you double on the sixth day. You see that? But we allow the enemy to steal a blessing. Not only do we agree to work when we should be worshiping, what happened? You don't give your body rest. So you get paid times and a half. But it will make you sick. If you will not rest your body, you may not get sick right away, but eventually it will eat up on your body. And the problem is this, workers who work like that, they are pushed by adrenaline and they wake up one day when they're 60 or 70 and they found out they have incurable disease. And the doctor says, you have been living in stress for the last 30 years. Take a vacation. You know, remember Brother Mon? He, he, he was a workaholic at Colgate Palmolive in the Philippines. He had this... Uh, Remember the sickness that he has? And the doctor says it can no longer be cured. But there is hope because you're young. He was not married yet. He was told, go to the province. Do you have a farm? And said, yes. Live in the cottage in the farm. Drink fresh carabao's milk every day. Breathe the fresh air. You know he got healed? Yeah. All he needs is rest. He was out of pollution. He was drinking we are being deceived into thinking we are making extra money. No, you are losing money. You will pay for it. Not only will you pay for it, God already said, if you honor my day, I will bless you. That's guaranteed. The blessing is there, not in excusing yourself. Oh, well, I have an understanding with God. That's a different God, not my God. Because I don't have an understanding with God. I have a word from God, and it says... Honor, well, God and me understand. Whoa, you are deceived. There is no understanding there. This is non negotiable. Okay? This is non negotiable. God already said, You honor me and I will bless you. And that's it. And because God, and He fought for that, and because God was blessing Jacob, he, Jacob would not allow Laban to steal it from him. You have to be passionate for the blessing. Our, our last lesson on, on uh, walking with the fathers. You, you give the blessing to whoever is serving God. You know, it, it amazes me. So, some parents, they give favor on the ungodly. Well, because my, my other child is going to heaven anyway, so he favors the, he favors the ungodly. The Bible allows you, uh, grants you to favor the godly, not the ungodly. The favor should be on those who are serving God, not on those who are not serving God. God favors those who fear Him, not those who doesn't fear Him. I like what, what Lester Samuel said. Lester Samuel said, I have a simple belief on blessing. He said, I bless those whom God is blessing, and I curse those whom God is cursing. He said, if I bless those whom God is cursing, then I'm fighting God. If I curse those whom God is blessing, I also fight God. So he said, I bless whom God is blessing and curse whom God is cursing. He said, I'm in the right spot when I do that. You see? 
But this is thinking the right way. And so, Jacob decided, well, I can't be cheated all my life. I've got I've to build my own business. The Lord has blessed me. And so he decided, because Laban will not let him go, he just, he just escaped. You know, and, and won. And met, met Esau on the road in, the, in that process. But this is, I am going to, now he is a very generous guy, and you can see it in his meetings with, with Esau and other people. Very generous guy. But you don't steal from me. You, see? you don't steal from me. My wife was uh, given a ticket uh, on the house, the second house that we have. And how, how much was the ticket on? 23000 dollars penalty you know because you know why she got that she did not listen to me you know? uh, her and uh, Diana they were they were pulling grass from the forest preserve property and they were digging I said I said that, that's not your property don't, don't touch that and, and and my wife says well well you know nobody I said, I said government minds so, so they, they they dug the two of them, I was, I was upset. Why are you having Diana do that? I said, that's not our land. Oh, nobody know this. Just, just keep digging. Oh, the inspector came. 23,000. Yeah. Now that, who's going to pay that? I told my mom, I'm not going to pay that. And how much 23,000 is? That's 23,000. <laughs> But my wife recognizes her mistakes and her errors, you know, sometimes. So she went to the government and faced her own music. Yeah. And she ended up paying how much on? $100. Yeah. Look, did she make a mistake? Yes. But listen, when the favor of God is on you, you do the right thing. He will bless you. Instead of paying 23000 she paid $100. By the way, do you, do you guys get the speeding ticket and the, uh, how do you call the ticket on the, in the toll? The toll ticket, right? Where do you go the toll way? Sometimes I'll have tons of these tickets. You know what I do with those tickets? I give them to my wife. She is highly favored all the time. And she will go to the, what, to the oasis and line up. And she, every time she does this, I, I go to uh, McDonald's and eat, you know. I don't talk to those people. And she walks away not only not paying any penalty, less. Yeah. And I ask, how do you do that? He said, well, I, I, I made a mistake. I, I, I repent and I ask God for forgiveness. And the Lord still gives her favor. It's, um, it's amazing to me. So when I have problems with the government, guess who faced the government? My wife. <laughs> because me, I just get upset too, you know. <laughs> if the government gets upset with me, if they raise their voice, I raise my voice too. <laughs> it, it, that's not good make negotiator, you know. So uh, that's just how it is. So she, she's got a pretty face. And I guess they like it. So uh, that's, that's the favor of God on her life. You see? But she would not allow anybody to steal from her. She will fight for every penny. I mean, literally for every penny. She'll fight for it. Yeah. You have to fight for your blessing. Because God is giving it to you for you to have. You know? I, I told you, look, take, take your wife's purification. Uh, I'm, I'm all for it because you, you've got to enjoy it. You know, Pastor Gina was telling me uh, today, he just came from a cruise and he said, well, H Hansel gave me a tip, you know. And so he, was, he was very happy. And I mean, he brought me two, two uh, packs of root beer. Uh, and, and, and he said, wow, well, the Filipinos are dead. And he was just super blessed. And then he said, he said then, I said, did you take your mother-in-law? He said, yeah, I, I took my mother-in-law. It was very important. You know, you make sure you take your mother-in-law. Why? Because the mother-in-law is the mother of your spouse. Uh, so, 
So he took his mother-in-law, he took his brother-in-law, and they were on the cruise, and they were very happy. And so he said, I said, hey, ne next time you go on an Alaskan cruise, I heard it's a very good cruise. He said, yeah. And he said, I want to take you with me. I said, no. People have fun on the sea. I don't, you know. I'd rather eat crabs on the shore, uh, not, not on the sea. But uh, this, look, we waste, we waste our money on a lot of nonsense. You spend it on family vacation and, and, uh, and time with your spouse. And I think it's a, a, a money worth, worth spending. Well, Pastor, so I don't want to borrow money. Well, you borrow it anyway, you know. Better spend it on, on, on a good reason. But, but, but you have to be passionate about the blessing. You know, my, my, my wife to told me this. Why is it that when your kids ask for something, you don't give it right away, but you don't say no? Because part of the reason why God is blessing me is because of my kids. God will not give me what, what I have if I don't have five kids. And all of my five kids are big eaters. I mean, I, th I think I eat only 1% of what they eat. I, I don't know where they put the food. James is already, <laughs> James is in so much pain. Yeah. Because, uh, how do you call the thing that was adjusted, the metal? Uh, is, that, is that called braces? Oh, is that, that's called the braces. And he said, oh, Papa, he said, he said, it hurts too much. And by the way, he's used to adjustment. And he, he, uh, he imagined that the moment his braces are adjusted, it takes around two hours for the pain to kick in. So after the braces was adjusted, he told Mama, bring me to Chick-fil-A right away. Quickly, quickly. You know, so they ate. <laughs> and after he finished eating, that's when the pain kicked in. He said, I thought so too, Papa. That's why I ate right away. And so he was, he was in so much pain. You know, and I said, I said, come on. You're my son. Bear the pain. Bleed, but eat. He said, oh, no. But this morning, he could not hold it anymore. He said, I don't care if it's painful. I'm eating, you know. So he's eating, and while eating, ah, oh, it hurts. Doesn't matter. Eat again. Oh, that, that hurts. Yeah. I'm, and my, my kids are big eaters. You think God is giving me all the food in my house for me to eat? I don't eat. I'm old now, and my metabolism went down. I, I don't eat a third of what they eat. Yeah. But God gave me a big family, so the Lord has to provide. Now, can you imagine if you're a parent like me and your, your, your children says, Papa, I want to eat this. No. Papa, I want to eat, try that. No. What are you going to use the blessing for? What, what are you going to use it for? And then when your friends, a no good friend came to you and borrow money and you loan the money. And the person is not even serving God. And not only when, when, when your friend who's not serving God or your relative who's not serving God asks you for money, you know he's going to waste it. And you give it anyways. And all that your children is asking is, is a good food in a restaurant. That's a no-brainer. You know, that's a no-brainer. Well, but if my kids are not serving God, they, they, they don't get anything, you know. You have to serve God. That's just the way it is. You, see? you cannot allow the enemy to steal your blessing. Well, if remember, God is passionate about blessing you. If, if I have time, I'll teach that to you. God's passion and blessing. Oh, he's, he's very passionate. You, you think it's hard to get blessing from God? You don't know God. God actually is more eager to bless you than you think. In fact, this is what he said. I will bless you way beyond what you can even think or imagine. So you're asking God, Lord, give me a car. And he was thinking, you're only thinking of one car. I'm willing to give you more than one. You're serving him, you see. More than what you can ask or think. But he wants you to nurture and nourish. He doesn't want you to, lose, to, to, uh, to, to, uh, to squander the blessing like the prodigal son. This affects uh, the future of the family of Jacob. Later on, look how prosperous he is. Later on, there was a famine in the whole land. And so he doesn't know that the son Joseph survived. So they heard that there was food stored in Egypt for a cost. Listen to the scriptures. Jacob, without hesitation, told uh, the boys, go to Egypt. Bring some money. They have money. Bring some money. Buy the, the grain. That's a prosperous guy. 
I don't care if it's in Egypt. There is food there. I have money for your travel, for your caravan accommodation, for everything that you need. And to pay whatever it takes, bring the food. That's the blessing. Now, if, if Jacob is a gambler, if Jacob squanders his wealth, will there be money? He knows how to say it. He knows how to say it. Now, listen. Uh, gas prices are rising. And again, thanks to those who voted for Biden. You know, I enjoy the gas prices. Uh, and they say the food prices, because of what's happening in Ukraine and in China, is, is going to continue to go up. But if you know how to save the blessings that God blessed you with, you will not be. At the start of the pand pandemic, I told my wife, these things are going to happen. I said, you save some money. I said, at least three months. I said, where the church can shut down and there's no offering, but we will survive. And we prepare this church. And you know, we paid off the building already. Zero mortgages. You know what zero mortgages mean? Zero. <laughs> so, I, I don't want that problem. So I, I, I told the Lord, we need to pay this thing off. And the Lord made us debt free. We're able to save. Yeah, we're able to save. Now, am, am I going to go out and say, oh, we get extra money, I'm going to buy me a new car. Are you crazy? With, with this time, I'm not a fool. The price of cars right now went up by at least 30% even more. You see, the spare parts are even more expensive right now. This is not the time for that. You see, you, you cannot allow the devil. Now, some, when are we going to buy? I need a car. I'm telling you, this, these people who did not save, who did not prepare, and doesn't have the blessing of God, they have good cars. If they run out of money, they'll sell it for peanuts. That's when the time you buy. That's when the time you buy. You see? But if, if you don't know how to uh, take care of the blessings of the Lord in your life, you're going to have nothing. You see? And, and Jacob does not appreciate, I, I even appreciate the fact that, that uh, few people are planting in my backyard, and my wife, my wife is even bragging, what do you want, sweetheart, for, for dinner? Soup. And he will, she will say, I have fresh vegetables. Not from the market, but from the garden, you know. Uh, do you know that that is a lot of savings right there? A lot of savings. So there's, there's a, you need to be passionate about whatever blessing God is giving to you. Listen, I have said this so many times. Don't, do not give your blessings to the devil. Okay? Do not give it to the devil. Use it for serving God. Okay? And then, oh, I like this. Jacob has passion to be what God wants him to be. Let's read the story. Now we're in Genesis chapter 32. Okay? Verse 24. Now this was when he already ran away from, from Laban. Covenant was cut. And he's on his way to Canaan. Chapter 32, verse 24. Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he could not defeat him, he struck, by the way, when it says, when the man saw that he could not defeat him, that's a bad translation. I think the proper rendering is when, when the angel of the Lord saw that Jacob would not quit. That's the, you know, some, this, this translator sometimes loses the context. Because here the following verse says, when he, the man saw that he could not defeat him, he struck Jacob's hip socket as they wrestled and dislocated his hip. When he would not quit, he touched his hip. It got dislocated in his socket. Then he said to Jacob, let me go for his daybreak. Now, his, his hip is already dislocated. And he said, let me go for his daybreak. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. What is your name? The man asked. Jacob, he replied. Your name will no longer be Jacob, he said. It will be Israel because you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. That's what you mean by Israel. 
He struggled with God and man and prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please, tell me your name. But he answered, Why do you ask my name? And he blessed him there. Jacob then named the place Peniel, for I have seen God's God face to face. He said, Yet my life has been spared. The sun shone on him as he passed by Penuel, limping because of his hip. That's why still today the Israelites don't eat the thigh muscle that is in the hip socket because he struck Jacob's hip socket at the, high, at the thigh muscle. Now, ever since Jacob appeared in the Bible, God had always wanted, uh, he had, Jacob had always wanted what God wants for him. So Jacob has a passion for God wants him to have. He also has a passion for God wants him, for what God wants him to be. Two things, okay? He has a passion for God wants him to have. And he has a passion for God wants him to be. Most people only have a passion for God wants him to have. Not for what God wants them to be. So they don't get both. Okay? God will bless you with everything that you need for life in Godliness because of what He wants you to become. Okay? God wants Him to have the birthright. Jacob wants it too. God, uh, God doesn't want him to marry just anybody else. Most people will quit at this point. God said... I don't want you to marry from the family of unbelievers. I want, I want godly children. And so, marry, marry the same faith. Jacob says, amen to that. What did Esau say? You hate the children of Ishmael. I'll marry uh, an Ishmaelite. He despised the birthright. You see. I was telling you this morning, along with the blessing comes responsibility. God says, I will give you the blessing of Abraham. I'll give you the blessing of Isaac. But these are the conditions. Okay? These are the conditions. He, God wants him to go back to the promised land. Your, your exile in Aram, it's temporary. I want you to go back to the land of promise. That's what I'm giving you, not, not Aram. Don't touch it. That's not yours. Now, he's already settled in a, he's already settled in Iran. There's another man of God who settled, actually, and, and God struggled with him, and that's Moses. Moses doesn't want to go back to, to, to Egypt to, to, to take on his responsibility. He wants to stay as a shepherd. The guy was raised to be a redeemer of uh, Israel, but he said, no, no, not me. Jacob said, yeah, it's me. Well, this guy has a passion, you know. You're already settled in Padan Aram. You're already prosperous. You married the only two daughters of your, of your uh, father-in-law. You got him now. Even if he's a deceiver, you can outwit him. But he said, no, this is not where God wants me to be. It is important. You know, my, my wife, my wife uh, asked me, why, why do you want to go back to the Philippines? I don't belong permanently in the U.S. I, I just don't. I, I, I believe I will be more effective. In the, I am delayed for so, by, by so many. I have, I have attempted already before. But I, I am delayed by so many years. But I'm still passionate about going back to the Philippines. My, my kids have, have grown up. Uh, my wife told me, well, I want to, if we're going to go back to the Philippines, she said, I want to uh, live in a secure community. I said, I'll give you that. You know, I don't have the money for that, but I said, I'll give you that. If it's not what settled her, you know. Uh, I, I really want to go back to the Philippines. Uh, I wish I can, I, can, I can go back right away, you know. But it seems like, if you study the life of Jacob, it seems like everything that God wants him, he wants it too. And everything that God wants him to be, he wants it too. That, that is some passion. However, his mistake is, he's always trying to get it and be and be what God wants him to be, using his own skills and his own abilities. He likes it, but he never really relied 
on God to deliver it on his own time. He always want to go ahead of God. Yeah. And isn't that the basic mistake that we make? Yeah. I, I told you, I'm so blessed with my marriage. I, I love my wife, and I always tell my wife that I love her more than she loves me. You know, in the Philippines, Filipinos are young. We marry young. Uh, I think a, a woman in the Philippines at the age of 20 or 25, if you're not married, people start asking questions, you know. Well, my wife waited also. I, I got married at 32. She was, she was 30. And uh, I have my reasons. Part of the reason is there are some things that God told me to do. I wasn't, I wasn't in heaven. I'm not, I was looking at some of the marriages that my friends had. And these are pastors ruining their ministries. Ruined it. Bad marriage. A lot of pastors married poorly. And when you marry poorly, you're going to be squashed, you know. Okay, can you imagine you have pressure from everywhere and then you go home? Your wife is a motor mouth, you know. Bungangera. Uh, 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 and then she doesn't know how to cook. And then she smells bad. That's, that's double whammy, you know. Uh, you, you, need, you need to marry right. I cannot, I cannot uh, overstate that enough. There are wrong marriages. There are wrong marriages. If you don't believe me, you are blind. But the moment you say, I do, you make it work. You don't ask God's will after you say, I do. You ask God's will before you say, I do. After you say, I do, by all means, you make it work. And over 50% of Christians could not make it work. Yeah. And so you, 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 need, you need to have that kind of, of passion. So uh, I, I told the Lord that and he, he got me my wish. But then, but then Jacob was always in a hurry. You know. He was always in a hurry. You know, there are some people who could not wait. Always in a hurry. Could you please just wait? Uh, it, it took us a while to teach our kids that. Because when they were very young and growing up, they want to buy this and they want, they want this toy. J just wait a little bit. At the beginning, they could not wait. You buy them and after you, you buy, there's a new model. You know. uh, some of you are in a hurry to buy the new iPhone, and then after you buy it, there's a, there's a, there's a, news, a new one is about to be released. Well, of course, you have to buy it because, because uh, there will always be a new release. But we don't even know how to use our phone yet, and we want a new release. Uh, I still don't know how to use my iPhone fully. Um, my kids are telling me, you can use it that way. I know I can use it that way. You know? uh, who's time to to uh, play with the thing all the time, you know. Uh, my, my, my kids ask me, Papa, what kind of game do you play on the, the phone? The games that you don't need to think, you know. <laughs> you know some, 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 I have seen some adults, they are very passionate about the, how do you, the games that your kids play, Tour of Duty, uh, uh, sh shooting, you maneuver. <laughs> that is so tiring, you know. I watch my kids play it. And they told me, Papa, please. Just. So I said, okay. I just keep hitting the trigger until it ran out of bullet and I was dead. Okay, that's done. <laughs> so I like games that, that you don't need to think. But most of us don't even know how to use the thing. And, and we, are, we are caught by this running with the new, new latest model. Now, there's nothing wrong with that if you have money coming out of use, but these things are expensive. You know, how, how much is a and how much is a new phone, the iPhone? Twelve hundred dollars. I can buy new tools with that. You know, <laughs> right, brother really? Willie? I'd rather buy tools. You know, uh, but 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 listen, uh, 
Jacob could not wait. And he came, if not for the grace of God and the anointing on his life, this guy would have been dead a long time ago. People don't realize it. If not for the grace of God in our lives, we're gone. But it's an amazing thing because, and this is, that's why I have to be passionate about the blessing because God blessed Jacob. You cannot touch Jacob unless God allows you. Anybody who, who dare touch Jacob without God's yes, you're done. Okay? And that is the unique thing about being blessed by God. That's why no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Some people are, I need to be perfect. Look, nobody's going to be perfect. But if you will just recall mentally the number of things that the Lord allowed us to escape from simply because He loves us. You know, all He needs is for us to be faithful. And so keep struggling until now He's running away from, from Laban. Laban caught him. And Laban said, you stole from me. And he said, no, I didn't. So he said, why did I steal from you? Well, you stole one of my gods. Can you imagine this guy? <laughs> he stole one of the idols. Because Rachel he stole it. And did not tell her husband. Now, it depends on who handles the money. But, you know, we can easily apply it on debit card or credit card. The husband says there is money there. But she didn't know the wife already used it to buy her bag or to buy her shoes. And you didn't tell him. Rachel did not tell him. But he's, she's also a liar. So what she did is sat on it and says, I have my monthly period, you know. <laughs> this, this, this family, you know. But the blessing of God is on them. And so he could not just go back, even if they cut a covenant, he could not just go back to Padanaram. But now the advance party, because a caravan like that will have advance party. Why? Because there are bandits laying on the road. They have to be pre-informed so they can prepare. But now the news is this. Hey, listen. Somebody is approaching this way. And it looks like your brother Esau. Man, he got nervous. Because then he remembered the threat. I will kill you. But this time, Esau is wealthy with an army and a very powerful feudal lord. Jacob doesn't have an army. He's a scheming guy. So what he did was separated his uh, wives left and right for one to survive. But he could not sleep that night. And that is when an angel of the Lord appeared and wrestled with him. When it says the angel of the Lord could not prevail on him, what it actually meant was this. Jacob would not quit because now he is at the end of the rope. He, no, he's not going to die because he has got the, but he doesn't know that. He's just beginning to understand what the blessing is. So he, he the angel of the Lord touched the socket of his hip and he became, he started limping and let me go. It's daybreak already. I will not let you go until you bless me. And that is when his name was changed from Jacob to Israel, from someone who deceives and supplants to someone who is tribe or is driven with God as a prince. He contends with God and yet prevailed. Okay? And man. He prevailed not only with God, but with men. Now, this is the time when, when uh, we have to understand what prevail means. It's not that Jacob, it, it doesn't say Jacob defeated God. But he finally, when, when he was wrestling with God, God is looking for humility from us. Okay? 
And sad to say sometimes that humility happen, comes the moment we are pushed against the wall and there is nowhere to go. Jacob has nowhere to go. I will not let you go until you bless me. It's daybreak. Touch. Sakit of He started limping. In fact, if, if I will read properly, the angel of the Lord was toying with him. Have you, have you ever, uh, when, when uh, Joseph wrestled with me the most, the second one was, was, was is, is James. But when, Jake, when, when, when Joseph was young, when I was stronger than, no, he's a lot stronger than me. When, uh, when I was, I was uh, when he was very young, I will just toy with him. And he will tell me, Papa, you play dirty. I'll just toy with him. Because, and I, sometimes we will arm wrestle, I will pretend I am losing, but he knows I'm not losing, you know. Uh, as a father, I, I enjoy playing with him. But no more, you know, because the boy is big and the boy is a lot stronger than me now. So I don't, I don't play with him anymore. I just use my, my paternal moves and, uh, and it's, it stops him. Uh, there are moves that only fathers can do, you know. So, but, but, Joseph, but Joseph told me this. He said, you know, Papa, when I knew I was stronger than you, he said, because one day we were wrestling and I was able to get away from you, he said. And he said, you're doing your best to lock me in and you could not do it anymore. And then you sat down and you said, I'm tired, let's stop. <laughs> that's, that's, he said, that's when I know I have already prevailed. But this time, God is not, it's not weaker. But, you know, a, a desperate man, let me go. I will not let, I have nowhere else to go. I will not let you go until you bless me. By the way, don't think that that is the only time he asked the angel of the Lord that request. That whole night, that is what he was asking. Why are you wrestling with me, Jacob? I want your blessing. And he was toying with Jacob. Daybreak, I don't know why daybreak. He touched Sakit of Pesip. And, and he started limping. He's no longer normal. Time for you to quit. He said, I'm not quitting. I didn't get your blood. He was saying, look, look, look God, I am desperate here. <laughs> you can make me cripple. You can limp me. I'm dead anyways. Please just bless me. That was the time when Jacob met the covenantal requirements needed for God to bless him. When he saw the total humility of Jacob, what is your name? Oh, God, I'm just a deceiver. I scheme my way to getting the birthright. I scheme my way to getting the blessing. I scheme my way out of Laban. I'm just Jacob, but please bless me. I could not do it anymore. You know, I'm about to be annihilated here. And God says, from now on, your name will be Israel. Meaning one who prevailed who wrestled with God and prevailed with God and man. That is, listen to me, the personality of the nation of Israel. That nation right now is still not humble before the Lord. And the Bible says they will be pushed against the wall. And God will pour out the spirit of prayer and supplication and the desire of the nation will come. But that nation will be pushed in the corner. They're operating under human wisdom, human skills. They think they can play with Russia. Now they have a problem with Russia. But they'll be pushed like that. But the personality of Israel is this, they prevail with God because of humility. They prevail with man also. They will prevail. That is the personality of that nation. And by the way, that is the personality of the sons of Abraham. That is the personality of the church. And I'm telling you, if, the church, if us as a church, we'll just learn to humble ourselves as individuals. We'll just learn to humble ourselves. Lord, Lord, I've tried everything. And some of us are still very happy trying it in our own way. And God is saying, this is the way we walk in it. God, I have tried everything. It doesn't work. Please, bless me. The moment you have that utter humility, then that is when God can exalt you. 
but, but that is the passion of Jacob. Amen. Amen. Well, we'll continue next week. You learn something tonight?